And welcome everybody to Long Prime Daily. I'm Jesse Weber. Harvey Weinstein, the disgraced movie mogul already convicted of rape in New York, is now a convicted sexual predator on both coasts. On Monday, after 10 days of deliberation, a jury in Los Angeles County found Weinstein guilty of three sex crimes in connection with a Russian-Italian model. Jurors acquitted Weinstein of another crime, and they deadlocked on the remaining three. Jurors returned to the courthouse on Tuesday morning to hear about aggravating factors that could impact Weinstein's sentencing. Now, he's already serving a 23-year sentence for sex crimes convictions in New York. His legal team has filed an appeal, but this latest conviction in California all but guarantees that Weinstein will never get out of prison. Because of the mixed verdict, Weinstein faces between 18 and 24 years behind bars. Right now, he's 70 years old. One of the decisions the jury deadlocked on was the case of Jane Doe No. 2, identifying as Lauren Young. She testified in L.A. and New York, serving as a prior bad acts witness in Weinstein's first trial. Young's attorney, Gloria Allred, says she's prepared to testify a third time if she has to. Part of a statement from Young was read after the verdict. I'm so grateful that I had the chance to tell the truth about what happened to me back in 2013. I am relieved that Harvey Weinstein has been convicted because he deserves to be punished for the crimes that he committed and he can no longer use his power to intimidate and sexually assault more women. After the New York City trial, a pandemic, a baby, and this Los Angeles trial, I can finally put this traumatic memory to rest. It will be for the prosecutor to make that decision as to whether he will retry uh, the count for Lauren Young and uh, will await that decision. All right, I'm here with co-host and former trial attorney Terry Austin. Terry, first he's convicted in New York, then he's convicted in California, but did the cases have any impact on each other? Oh, they definitely impacted each other. So the two cases, I think, are, um, you know, held in different states, obviously, and they involved different accusers. Weinstein's already, as you mentioned, serving the 23 years in New York, but he appealed that verdict, and the New York Court of Appeals agreed to hear the case, which means there was at least one reasonable appellate issue. Now, the California conviction is significant because even if the New York conviction is overturned, Weinstein still faces those 24 years behind bars in California. His attorneys have said they're going to appeal that, too. But assuming both convictions are upheld, Weinstein would likely serve out his sentence in New York and then serve the second sentence in California. So, of course, both parties could agree where they're going to serve that sentence. And, you know, statistically speaking, as you mentioned, he's 70 years old. Likelihood he will not serve two full sentences. Yeah, definitely not good. Brian, so I'm here with Brian Buckmeyer, uh, for our other co-host and public defender. He's likely going to appeal California's verdict. Is that going to be successful? It is a long shot to say the least, but I do think he has some arguments here. I think he's going to look at this as a situation where, yeah, he's convicted based on one of the accusers, but the others was a mixed bag. And then you have these prior bad act witnesses. For him, he's going to look at the glass kind of half uh, full, so to speak, and he's going to probably say, hey, if these other bad actors didn't testify, maybe the one and only victim who convicted him might have not had a conviction. I don't know. But for him to be able to win an appeal in in uh, California, then again in New York, it's a long shot, but I can see him putting all of his resources towards it. Yeah, he was really banking, I'm sure, on not getting convicted in California because he was hoping that the New York conviction would be overturned. Not a great day for Harvey Weinstein. Moving over to Ohio on Monday, George Wagner IV learned his fate in connection to the 2016 Pike County Massacre. Now, Wagner was convicted of aggravated murder after a trial that lasted months. During the sentencing hearing, a family member of one of the eight victims told Wagner, quote, I hope you burn in hell. Prosecutors considered members of the Roden and Gilly families to be collateral damage in a child custody battle between Wagner's brother Jake and victim Hannah Roden. Jake and their mother Angela testified against Wagner after pleading guilty to avoid the death penalty. But the patriarch of the family, George Billy Wagner, still faces his own trial. As for George Wagner IV, well, he was given eight consecutive life sentences plus 121 years for the eight victims that were killed. Wells Fargo was slapped with another record-breaking fine to settle claims that it was part of banking violations that harmed millions of consumers. 
On top of a $1.7 billion fine, the bank agreed to pay another $2 billion in damages. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau says that the bank misapplied customer payments on loans, wrongfully repossessed cars and homes, and charged overdraft fees even when customers didn't overdraw their accounts. Well, the bank has already started to repay some of the customers. Much of that $2 billion in damages is going to go towards further fixing accounts, including repaying more than $200 million in overdraft fees alone. Testimony continues this week in the case of Tory Lanez, a Canadian rapper accused of shooting fellow rapper Megan Thee Stallion. Prosecutors called a DA investigator Jody Little to the stand on Monday. And Little did the September interview with Kelsey Harris, which was played in full for the jury last week. Harris is Megan's former assistant and friend who was with her in Lanes in 2020 when Lanes allegedly shot at or near Megan's feet, injuring her. The prosecution asked Little about a diss track that was put out by Harris after the shooting. Some of the song lyrics mention the incident, which happened after a get-together at Kylie Jenner's home. While Harris told the district attorney's office in September that she saw Lane shoot Megan, she backtracked once she was on the witness stand. Now, Brian, it seems to me that if the prosecution wanted to know about the diss track, they could have asked Kelsey Harris about it when she was on the stand. Absolutely, Jesse. Bringing in this testimony this way just baffles the mind of many defense attorneys. The song is called Bussing Back. It was a diss track by Kelsey Harris to Megan Thee Stallion, seemingly in response to their fallout after the shooting, and the prosecution is trying to use it as a confession. Using rap lyrics at trial is controversial to say the least, especially when prosecutors pick and choose what they use. And this isn't the first time lyrics have made headlines. We've heard about Young Thug in his case in Georgia. Don't need to go over that again. But here, using lyrics seems absurd. The judge let the prosecution use the diss track of a witness who was already on the stand to try to prove a fact they could have gone from her. Well, she was under the oath when she testified, not when she rapped. When she said, if I was the one with the gun, you would have heard about a murder. Yeah. It's not a confession. Put her on the stand, ask her the questions, and that's a proper way to do this. Well, Terry, the jury watched the entire 80-minute interview of Harris, and then they saw her testify on the stand. What do you think they're thinking? Liar, liar, pants on fire is what I think they're thinking. She was just so different in her demeanor. When she did that interview, she was cool, calm, and collected. She seemed as though she was telling the truth. She was very credible. But when she got on that witness stand, she hemmed, she hawed, she hesitated. She couldn't complete any thought. And it did seem as though she was trying to change her story. And if I'm that jury and I'm listening to her and I'm comparing that to how she was when she did that interview, I would conclude that the interview was more credible. And in fact, the judge will give a charge on credibility and they can just throw her entire testimony out. Are we ever going to get an answer as to what really happened? I'm not sure. I'm not sure all said and done at the end of this trial, we're ever really going to know what happened between the two, or between the three, I should say.